Amen. Luke 23, 32 to 43, Easter themes. Please follow along as I read. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself. If he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we, indeed, justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. I suppose that living here in South Florida means that we miss some of the natural significance of Easter. You know, spring is here. We've survived the long, hard, cold winter, the long, dark nights. I think our world is a little upside down, right? We survived the summer and hurricane season and the wet season. But we understand that there's a, there's a significance to spring. It's, it's about more than, uh, well, I can, I can wear white now in springy colors. It's about more than we, we hunt Easter eggs. I was amazed to discover last night all the kids in my neighborhood out hunting down Easter eggs at night, and they, they now have glow-in-the-dark eggs. Didn't have that when I was little. But we understand, though, that these are symbols and that they should direct our attention to something that they represent, something that is eternal, something that's found in Christ, the life of God, eternal life that is ours in Jesus Christ. And really to lay a hold of these themes, today we want to look at the text that we just read where Jesus is crucified. And we, we, we read and understand about what Jesus accomplishes in the resurrection because of what took place on the cross, that Jesus emerged from the tomb victorious, and we understand what that victory means because we see what Jesus took into the grave with him. And that the crucifixion and the resurrection provide some essential things for us. Really, three themes we're going to look at today. Forgiveness, salvation, and a kingdom. Forgiveness, salvation, and a kingdom. Let's look at the first theme. Jesus provides forgiveness. It's crucifixion and resurrection. We see this here in verses 32 to 34. Jesus is crucified. He's crucified between two criminals. He himself, though he is completely innocent, is is treated as a criminal. And in the midst of this injustice, Jesus offers amazingly, a prayer of forgiveness for his executioners. And in doing so, he's demonstrating, he's teaching us about the heart of God, about the purposes of God, 
and that Jesus, through his death and through his resurrection, provides forgiveness for those who don't deserve it. Jesus is crucified at a place called the Skull, Golgotha. It's called this because of the, the place, the rock protruding from, protruding from the hill formed the shape of a skull, but fittingly, it sets the scene as a place of forsakenness. And there, Jesus is crucified. Crucifixion was not simply a means of execution, not simply a means of tremendous human suffering, the infliction of, infliction of pain, but it was, it was designed and intended to hu- humiliate, to expose. So the victim was completely stripped of all clothing and mocked and displayed as he helplessly suffered. And we want to understand that Jesus' death is more than just a death, but it's God is, God is teaching us about our need for forgiveness, about how sin dehumanizes us, how our separation from God results in a disfigurement, if you will. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. Jesus, completely innocent. And how do we understand the mystery of this statement? In 2 Corinthians 5.21, he becomes sin. Perfect humanity, Jesus, now offering forgiveness for his executioners. In all honesty, I have to tell you that I find Jesus' prayer on the cross somewhat troubling. He, he, he prays for his executioners to be forgiven, stating that they know not what they do. And I want to say, well, they don't know what they do, don't they? Don't they have some understanding? Isn't there, aren't, aren't, aren't those that are crying out for the crucifixion and those mocking Jesus and and the, and, the, and the leaders of Israel and the leaders of Rome and those, aren't, aren't all of these parties complicit in the execution of a completely innocent person? Do they really not understand what they're doing? And, and, and yet, clearly Jesus means what he prays and, and there's, there's something significant for us to lay hold of here that Jesus, okay, on the one hand, they don't understand the significance of who Jesus is and the fullness of what's transpiring. But Jesus is not offering just a passing prayer. He's, he's making an argument. He's presenting a case. He's pleading for their forgiveness. And that's why he is on the cross. Forgiveness. Sin. Our need for forgiveness. These are not happy themes These are not even themes that we readily embrace. They're certainly not currently popular themes. When our children were little, we would require them when they hurt one another to ask for forgiveness. So, you know, there would, every two or three years, one of them would do something horrible and offend the other, and, and uh, we would say, okay, you have to ask for forgiveness. Now, they would say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it. And one is an emotional response, and the other is a complete lie, right? <laughs> and so, I mean, looking back, I think we probably overdid it. Maybe we're even at times a little legalistic. We would make them say, please forgive me, and then we would make them state the offense, and we would use this language. It was like they were on trial, you know, <laughs> say, please forgive me, state the offense. And then the, the, the offended party would chime in, state the offense. <laughs> Raising little Pharisees so well. 
So I'm pretty sure they, they, they generally didn't mean it in their hearts at all. You know, uh, the, the, the offended party would have to say, I forgive you. So what we were after there, and I, I think it's a good practice, what we were after is, you know, you have offended someone and, and you have to own that. And the offended party has to release it, let it go. There's a debt that has to be erased. And so, Scripture is very plain about this, though we more and more find ourselves wanting to move away from this idea. It's very fundamental and basic in terms of what the Scripture teaches Ancient prophecy given hundreds of years before Jesus' death, the prophet Isaiah. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned, everyone, we have turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And so Jesus there carries our sin to the cross so that he might provide forgiveness. Now, he's crucified between two criminals. And this is, in part, a very direct fulfillment of prophecy. He is being numbered amongst sinners, amongst transgressors. Again, Isaiah 53, 53, 12. And he was numbered with the transgressors, and yet he bore the sin of many. Jesus is crucified between two criminals because he's taking his place with sinful humanity to identify with us, to carry the penalty of our sins so that forgiveness might be provided. In the end of this section of Scripture, verse 34, we're told that lots were cast for his garments. And it's a little detail that also pushes back to a prophecy found in Psalm 22. Psalm 22 is a portrayal of, of uh, the innocent being persecuted by the ungodly. And it's prophetic, speaking of Jesus. And Jesus comes to, and, and this is part of the, just the remarkable love of God and the miracle of Easter. Jesus comes to provide forgiveness for his enemies, for those who are persecuting the innocent. And, and so we find this reference back to this ancient psalm. It's more than just degrading. This is, here, here is Jesus identifying with all of the lostness of humanity in order to provide forgiveness. So just in, in, this, in this first point, it's rather, it's rather simple, but so important. If, if we look at Jesus and say, well, I've really done nothing that needs forgiveness, then we don't need Jesus, or at least according to our own awareness, we don't. Most typically, as the Spirit of God visits our hearts, his second movement in our hearts is to convict us of sin. Second? Yeah, second. The first movement, the Spirit of God, is to begin to reveal who God is. And there's this simple little progression. It works, it works in this manner. We begin to behold God in His glory, and then we're no longer comparing ourselves to other people. We're... The, the, the foundation which we use to provide a self-justification is removed when we see the glory of God and immediately following, almost like one event, we, become, we, we, began to, we, we begin to be aware of our own need for cleansing. So Jesus provides forgiveness. Secondly, Jesus provides salvation. He is mocked here on the cross repeatedly. He's mocked as the Savior. He's taunted and told to save himself. He's mocked as a king, as a ruler. And the implication is, is hey, if you can't save yourself, how can you save 
others. Jesus is rejected so that he can provide acceptance. And of course, the point here, and there's a deep, deep irony about what's happening, is that Jesus doesn't save himself so that he can save others. Our first point is forgiveness, but we don't stop at forgiveness. We can't stop with forgiveness because forgiveness is a complicated thing. When I was single, going to college, going to seminary, I had various roommates, various guy roommates, and, and um, you know, there would be occasional conflict, and the way it generally worked, just we would have a little spat and then quickly move on, and it was just kind of the way things were, and then, and then I got married, and uh, then in marriage, once in a while, <laughs> I would do some things that were bad, that were wrong. In my eyes, no, not a big deal and something we should move on quickly from, right? <laughs> and I was even quite willing to say, hey, I'm sorry, you know, a little pat on the back, let's move on. And like, she's not moving. <laughs> and a biblical counselor helped me see, he says, well, well, Brian, you know, there's more going on here. So first of all, you're, you're emotionally processing things differently and so here you are, you've, you've hurt her, you've wounded her, you've offended her, whatever the word is that we want to use. And she's, she's not even absorbed the impact of that. And you're just, you're just saying, I'm sorry, like nothing happened and moving right through it. Easy forgiveness doesn't work. And then on a deeper level, just staying with that little personal illustration... After a while, she's looking for more than just, I'm sorry, or please forgive me. She's looking for some evidence that you really mean it, right? There's wives shaking their heads right now, right? <laughs> right? Looking for some sense that this is sincere, like you're working on it. When you then take that out to... A greater level. I mean, so that, that, that's trivial, not to minimize my sin, but that's trivial in light of genocide, in light of school shootings, right? We don't just stand up 15 minutes later and say, hey, we forgive you, because it's a, it's a betrayal of everything we're feeling. It's a betrayal of our emotions. It's, it's, it's not honest, and, and we wrestle with, okay, I know that unforgiveness will eat me away. I know that I can't allow this bitterness and hatred. I need resolution. I need to be able to release this. Forgiveness is, is complicated. We need more than forgiveness. We need a Savior. We need salvation. We need someone who takes on sin and the death that it brings, and the cycle of destruction that is unleashed through its power. Desmond Tutu led the Truth and Reconciliation Commission for South Africa, and he wrestled with this whole idea of how does a, how does a nation deal with the atrocities of her past, multifaceted atrocities, there is a need to move on, there's a need for reconciliation, but also very difficult to deal with the weight and the seriousness of what's transpired. In an interview, Desmond Tutu said, as a victim of injustice and oppression, you lose your sense of worth as a person your dignity. Listen to those words again. As a victim of injustice and oppression, you lose the sense of worth as a person. You lose your dignity. Sin dehumanizes. It, it, it dehumanizes the people that we sin against. But then isn't it also true that it makes us less human? 
it disfigures the oppressor as well. Dostoevsky, in his novel, Crime and Punishment, some people have said, greatest novel of all time. I have, I have no idea how you decide that, but a great work. His main character, Raskolnikov, was a young man who decided to commit a murder, and he plans this perfect murder, and uh, the, the, the victim is an elderly pawnbroker. She's a moneylender and a, a not a good person, and you're almost wanting to see her eliminated, like the, the world would be better off without her, and that's, a, that's the justification that's provided, and that he's going to take the gains from the robbery and use it to, to help some family members and to do good, and so he does commit this murder, but it's gruesome, and there's a there's an evil that comes out in the act. And it's, it's, it's a vivid picture of how sin doesn't... We, we tell ourselves it's not that big a deal, and we justify it. But soon or eventually, it shows itself for what it is. The half-sister of the victim stumbles into the crime, and then he murders her. Again, a picture of how sin spreads. One murder quickly becomes two. Raskolnikov goes forward, tries to put it behind him, but it just eats at him. And he falls in love. He falls in love with a, a, a young woman named Sonia who has become a prostitute. Sonia's a prostitute in order, out of desperation, she's providing for her family. And he falls in love with her, and she knew the victims of his crime. She was friends with the elderly moneylender. And so as this eats at the main character, he eventually confesses his crimes to Sonia. And her response is, is, is so vivid. She, she just breaks down weeping, bitterly weeping. And she says, what have you done to yourself? You now, of all people, will be the most unhappy. And, and, and Dostoevsky is, is, is just showing us through these characters that, that our sin not only impacts others, but it impacts us so deeply. And then in an unusual kind of twist, you, you, you think, okay... This main character, he's, he's sort of redemptive now. Maybe he's trying to redeem himself from his past acts, and he's, he's saving this woman out of prostitution. But it, it's a bit of a flip. She actually is the redeemer in the picture. She, she tells him, listen, you have to face this. You, you cannot run from this. You have to confess it. And she leads him to confess his crime, which he does, and then promises, I will go with you to prison, and journeys with him to Siberia to go to prison. And, 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 and the picture here is one of just the, the, the depth of how our brokenness affects us in society. Scripture phrases it like this, for the, for the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus brings to us forgiveness, but he brings to us salvation. Salvation from sin, from its death, from the cycle of destruction. And listen, also from the wrath of God. The wrath of God? What kind of of God would God be if he were not incensed against evil and the destruction that it brings. But Jesus bears the weight of our sin, the penalty, and breaks its power on the cross and when he emerges then in victory from the grave. Jesus provides forgiveness, 
He provides salvation. And number three, a kingdom. A kingdom. So you have this, this mocking that builds through the narrative. Uh, Jesus is mocked by the religious leaders. He's mocked by the soldiers. In fact, the scene is, is really one where uh, he's offered wine and there's some debate over exactly what's happening when this sour wine is offered to Jesus. It's been typically believed that that was a, somehow a, an expression of mercy to numb the pain, to uh, help with the thirst, to prolong a little bit this person's life. Not that that in and of itself would be merciful. But it's very clear as Luke tells the story, that they were mocking him. They're mocking him as a king and, and as a supposed king. And the, the wine is like, here's your royal wine. And then, and then Luke makes a point of telling us that the inscription over his head is the king of the Jews. And in the midst of this, this cascading, this, this building of mockery over this theme, the thief comes out with this stunning confession. I want to be with you in your kingdom. You are the real king. You are the one true king. And he, he, he sees who Jesus is. He, he, he rebukes the other th criminal, tells him, listen, we, we deserve this condemnation. We deserve what we're giving. Do, do you see how he's modeling for us? And, and, and Luke is holding him up as, he, here's what you do with Jesus. You receive forgiveness. You receive salvation. You admit your sin. You confess it and trust in Christ and receive salvation. And then there's this kingdom. We're not just saved from something. We're saved to something. We're saved to paradise. We're saved to eternal life. I use the word kingdom here because we're taking it right from the text, right from the lips of the thief. It's marvelous. It's this glorious, uh, glorious picture of, of the salvation that is ours in Jesus Christ and the promise of the kingdom. Scripture teaches us through the resurrection that this kingdom is not just spiritual. But there's a redeeming of matter. There's a redeeming of the material. There's a redeeming of creation that happens, the cross and the resurrection, which is very important for us because I think if we picture heaven and, and we think it's, well, I'll never have a body and I'll, I'll just be like a, a spirit, a ghost floating about, playing a musical instrument and wearing a long white robe. It's, it's not how I want to spend my Saturdays. Right? It's, I, I understand being caught up in worship, and, 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 and maybe it's a depiction of that, but Scripture's emphasis is, no, there's the new heavens and a new earth and creation that is ours. Now, friends, ga just gather the significance of this, that, that what is taught to us on the cross is, is, is redemption for anyone who will come to Christ. I mean, the... Really, if you picture that scene as it's happening and, 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 and you just turn the volume off for a moment, the last person you expect to be redeemed is the thief that hangs next to Jesus. Gene Edwards pictures it like this. is all of creation, all of creation moves towards this place where the Lamb of God will give his life, and shed his blood for the redemption of God's world and creation. And God, in making this revelation clear, calls the people to himself, the nation of Israel. He gives great promises to Abraham. And, 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 and he begins, every move of the people of God is this deliberate move to, to picture, to teach. God desires to dwell with his people. He desires to fill us, to be with us. But we are enslaved to sin. And to bondage. And so God takes his people into Egypt, and there they become enslaved. And there's an exodus all picturing for us the salvation is ours. And just really in, the, in, in, in what may be the greatest picture of salvation in 
the Old Covenant, the Old Testament scriptures is, is the Passover lamb. So every Passover, year after year after year, lambs are slaughtered and blood is spilt, anticipating the day when the Lamb of God will give His blood for the forgiveness of our sin. And imagine this scene, that the day comes and all of heaven rushes to see the sacrifice of the pure, spotless Lamb of God. And Jesus is crucified and redemption is provided And the first new covenant uh, convert emerges into the paradise of heaven, and it's a thief that was hanging on the cross. The mercy of God to save sinners. And if you've tasted at all the destruction that sin against you can bring or the sin that you commit can bring, You will say, I will gladly lay down the pretension of I don't really need a Savior and run to that cross and fall before him and say, Jesus, save me, cleanse me, break the cycle of that destruction. For me, the glorious revelation of that came when I became a father because I I, I found it easier until that moment to justify the destruction of my own sin. But when I began to see how I couldn't protect, fully protect my children from my weaknesses, my sin, my failures, and the fear rose up that my shortcomings would destroy them for life, there was a a glorious moment, a glorious moment of revelation where I could say, you know what, I need a Savior. Now, I'm not pretending for a moment that I wasn't saved till then, but there are just these emerging revelations of the glory of God's salvation for us. He he invites you to freely come. So that's the message of Easter. You know, Easter eggs and, and spring colors and green emerging, wonderful symbols that point us to life and new life that are eternal. Let the themes of Easter be living realities in your own heart. Amen.